A lot of the iconic songs break the rules. It's all about feel at the end of the day. So I heard the melody first. It was just this beat that had like a Eleanor Rigby sample on it. My friend comes in and he like, yo, stop the music, boom. Yo, I was with this girl last night and guess what she gave me? I was like, what, what did she give you? And he was like, that thong, the thong, thong, thong. Just like that. That girl's so scandalous. And I know I never handle it. And she's shaking that thing like who's the fish with the look in the eye so devilish. I'm like literally writing the song talking about the date that I was on. How can I show my mom talking about some thongs? You got dumps like a truck, what are you kidding me? That's it, we got it, yo, it's a hit. That's a smash. Say it one time and make your life easier. Thong song took over the world. It was all about the thong song and it was all about that video. And then we get that call from my lawyer like, have a seat, if you're standing up, you might want to take a seat. And I'm like, oh my God, please, no. And then the negotiations started. Here we go, lawsuit. Thong song journey was a journey. It was a whirlwind. With the good comes the bad. It was crazy. <laughs> this is really what happened, I shit you not. I'm Cisco, AKA the dragon. I grew up in Baltimore, you know, the inner city, pretty rough. Kind of grew up with one foot like in the hood and the other foot kind of in the suburbs. I was about four or five. Michael Jackson comes on TV singing Billie Jean. And when he did the moonwalk, I felt like the world stopped. That was the moment that I said, you know what, I think that's what I want to do. Drew Hill and I became a group way back when we were like 14 years old. At the time I was working at a place called The Fudgery. We like made fudge and sang songs. It's really funny because I'm short, so it's like I was like a Keebler elf. And shit. So, <laughs> and once I turned 17, a business associate of ours asked us to come and sing for Hiram Hicks, who was running Island Black Music at the time. He wanted to sign us. It was like, okay, fudge record deal, fudge record deal. I don't know. I don't know, I think I'll go with the record deal. So we signed with Def Jam and we had the song Tell Me. That first single we put out went platinum and every commercial release after that was either platinum or multi-platinum. At the peak of our success and we just about to go to the next level and one of the guys drop out. Woody decided he didn't want to be in the group anymore. We have to release some new music, but I didn't think Drew Hill was the answer I told the group, hey guys, I wanna go do a solo album, and when I do, hopefully it'll buy Woody some time to figure out what he wanna do and he can come back to the group. When Cisco decided that he wanted to go solo, he was in a successful group, Drew Hill, they were doing well, you know, but it wasn't about the solo career with Cisco to me. It's about, he's a creative person. He wants to do things that people say he can't do, or he wants to try things like with his hair or his clothes. It was his way of being himself without people telling him he can't do it. It didn't make sense to anybody for me to do a solo album because the brand Drew Hill was lucrative at the time. The record company wanted another Drew Hill project. And at the time, they were like, okay, let's let him do his solo project. Hopefully it won't fail. And let's get back to Drew Hill. I put up my own money to record Unleash the Dragon. I just faced my fears and pushed forward. So before you know it, we're full-fledged on into the Cisco project. In 1999, me and my producer partner, Tim Kelly, we were carving our own path because we had worked with so many artists. We were working on Usher, we were working on Joe, we were working on Boys to Men. Kenneth Creer, he calls us, he was like, I'm managing Cisco, we're about to do a solo project. We're like, oh wow. At that time, they were considered one of the top five producers in the business, but their, their, their hits were coming from R&B. When people came to us, usually they came for mids or slows, you know what I'm saying, like slow jams. You know, and it was funny, people didn't think R&B producers could do pop music. At the time, me and Tim, we basically were in a creative space thinking about Michael Jackson a lot. We knew we eventually wanted to get on Mike's album. So we were doing a lot of ideas that were out of the box from the normal things people had heard us do. 
So that was creatively this new sound we were trying to forge before we were even in touch with Cisco. At the time, Tim was sampling a lot of West Montgomery, which is where the original sample from Thong Song came from. Ta-da, West Montgomery. It was his version of Eleanor Rigby, obviously from the Beatles. I started off with just this. That's all I heard, just that part, and I just kept looping it. Next thing I know, he, he's adding the kick in. Do, do. And then he starts adding the, you know, the percussions in, the hi-hats. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Oh, this is gonna be sick, wait a minute. And I could hear it just resonating through the walls. I'm like, are you serious? That's gonna be sick. So then I go upstairs. And we both just sitting there listening to it going crazy, like they didn't need anything else. So I just did that, just real simple. Before you know it, I had to beat. It just sounded very urgent. You knew that it was a game changer. But again, we're thinking Michael Jackson. At the time, he wasn't thinking Cisco. Burnt into a CD and a dad. I left it alone. I went to the next song. Three, four months later, Kenneth called us was like, Cisco want to meet with y'all, man. His album's done. He just want to see what y'all got. We had made a compilation of songs for Cisco. A lot of them were ballads, more in the R&B vein of Drew Hill. It probably was about 20 tracks on there. And the, the track that had the Eleanor Rigby sample in it, it literally was accidentally put with the bundle of songs that we sent them. When we met with Cisco, I rewound the dat. As soon as I pressed play, I realized this is that track. It was the first one on the dat, and I did it for Mike. Oh my, I was young know, when it came in. Cisco was like, yo, man, what is that? It was just this beat that had like a Eleanor Rigby sample on it. So then I heard him when I, ah, oh, man, you know what? That was nothing. I was, like, that was just nothing. Click, and I went to the next one. So we got the music loud, and he was like, he's over there. <laughs> Go back to the first one, man. And I'm just grooving like, yo, this is, this is ill. Like, this is the magic. Like, something about this is like dope. A song like that could be what you need to finish the album. I was like, I'm gonna be honest with you. I knew we were coming out here. So I did a batch of tracks for, for Mike. This was one of them. Ah, oh, man, come on, man, come on, man. I was like, I'm being honest, that's, that's what I did. And he was like, all right, man. Well, you know what? Just send me those ones that you showed me. I, I still like them, I love those. I was like, okay, cool. He gets on the plane, go back to Baltimore. My cell phone rings, it's Cisco. Cisco's on the airplane now, right? He's like, yo, man, Tim, I gotta have that, man. How much, you, how much money you want, man? I'm serious, man. Like, if you say I can have that, when I land, I'm gonna jump on another plane and come back. And then I'm like, really? If an artist like a song or a track that much, we gotta give it to him, man. Even though we had it for somebody else, and he already heard it on top of that. I messed up and played it, but I'm like, all right, Cisco, man, you got it. Next day, we in the studio. When Cisco came back to LA to record it, that's when the track was ready, but there's no song, there's no lyrics. So Cisco's writing, trying to figure it out. So I heard the melody first, but the words didn't really click. So I had a date that night. We get back to the crib. So we making out and I'm rounding second base. She decides she wants to get up and strip. It's the first time I had ever seen a thong. And it was glorious. <laughs> I'm like literally writing the song, talking about the date that I was on. The dress was so scandalous, you know another guy could handle it. This is like real life. The next day, my friends come over. I tell them, gather around. This girl had on a, a thong. And they was like, a what now? Needless to say, all my boys was like, literally like on a pilgrimage, like, you know, Lord of the Rings or whatever, to go find the thong, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is really what happened, I shit you not. And so when I get to the chorus, I, I didn't know what I should say. My friend comes in and he like, yo, stop the music, boom. Yo, I was with this girl last night and guess what she gave me? I was like, what, what did she give you? And he was like, that thong, the thong, 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 just like that. I was like, yo, what if right there I was like, what if I said that thong, the thong, thong, thong? They was like, ha that's funny, yeah, you would never do it. I was like, I think I'm gonna do that. I think I'm gonna say that, dude. And by the time I got to that part, everybody in the room said it with me, like, dong, 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 dong. I was like, look, it works. They got it, yo, it's a hit. That's a smash, that's it. It's funny, cause Tim calls me and I hear the music going in the back and he's like, hey, Bob, man, 
guess what the name of the song is? And I said, what? He said, thong song. I said, thong song? Really? <laughs> I was like, how can I show my mom I'm talking about some thongs, man. We definitely had some reservations in the beginning. So me and Tim, we've always been 100 percenters, meaning we did all the music and we also wrote all the lyrics, did all the vocal arrangements, everything. Here comes Cisco. you like, all right, this, I got this, I got this, I want to do this like this. And we were like, whoa, whoa. The Eleanor Rigby sample was a hurdle for me. Eleanor Rigby is Eleanor Rigby. This song needs its own music. I was like, yo, I'm gonna rewrite the string line. So I hired some people that played on Star Wars to play the string line. My name is Bruce Dukov. I'm a violinist in the studios in California, and I've done, to this date, over 1,800 feature motion pictures, not to mention television films and other things, and I'm the violinist on the thong song. I got the call from Def Jam Records to do this session for Cisco. Of course, I didn't know who Cisco was. I went to that studio. Cisco was there. I can't remember what color his hair was, but it was different. <laughs> so they played me a track, and it was very Eleanor Rigby-like. And then he was humming a part that he wanted me to play as an obligato, and I thought, is this something like this kind of sound? You want to have a... Uh... And he said, yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. Then I said, well, what do you want to have as a punch for it? He was going, yeah, like a dun, 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 dun. So I said, what about? And that's all going underneath. You know. So this is basically what you hear. First heard it, I'm not gonna lie, man. I was like, they don't even sound like my track now, man. The the drums and all that do, man. But at the same time, I'm not scared of change. I'm like, okay, if y'all want it, okay, cool. Cisco came up with a, an idea for a key change to modulate a half step up halfway through the song. It creates a powerful dynamic in the song when there's a modulation because it's like something is the same, but something is different. Well, it's different because the key of the song has risen. I did everything I could to that part to make that climax just really really feel epic. It was almost sexual in nature. Oh, yes! Yeah, yeah! <laughs> so I'm listening to the hook, and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm still trying to work with his sand thong. Yeah. It's hot, though. I can't, I can't even front of it. In my mind, I'm like, it's dope. Baby, back home. I, said I, like I gotta give it up to him. And it worked. It worked incredibly. So after we turned in the final mixes to Def Jam, that's when we find out that they had went with Gotta Get It as Cisco's first single. It was interesting because at the same time, all the DJs were like, Thong Song is the one. That's the one you need to go with. And then I, I want to say by like the third week into working his first single, they pulled the plug and it was like, we got to go directly to Thong Song. That's the thing that forced it to become the single were the DJs. Everybody just started playing it. And once you got the pop radio playing it, you know, radio's everything. Once they heard it, it was like automatic. Like we did not have to ask anybody to do anything. The song became so huge that you couldn't get away from it. I just remember that some friends of mine heard a song like that and they said, did you hear that song, Thong song? It's got this great violin thing going on it. And I said, no, I haven't heard it. And it dawned on me, maybe that's the song that I did. Thong song took over the world. Thong song took over radio. Thong song took over the album. You forgot about the first single. It was all about the Thong song and it was all about that video. This thing right here. We couldn't show thongs at that time in the video. I said, what if we show the thongs upside down? So technically you're not looking at a thong, but you are. They made it as racy as they could back in 99. You got dumps like a truck, what are you kidding me? Wait, let's be clear. When I said dumps like a truck, I did not mean anything about poop. Like, you know, when a dump truck backs up like beep, beep, beep. That's what I was thinking. Like, you know, she was backing that ass up and like a dump truck. Dumps like a truck. I kind of had like my own idea of what the video should be. I saw this thing on Bugs Bunny. Elmer Fudd was chasing Bugs Bunny and it was like literally running on top of people's heads. I was like, yo, I have to do that. Let me see that. They even got this meme, Jesus walked on water, but Cisco walked on bitches. <laughs> That's blasphemous and true. <laughs> 
So the thong song is going crazy. It's like killing the airwaves. And then, you know, we get that call from our lawyer, like, have a seat. If you're standing up, you might want to take a seat. You know, that's when all the drama started. I get a call from Def Jam. And they're like, hey, uh, we got a problem here. What's the problem? Well, there's a potential lawsuit from Ricky Martin because we stole the interpolation of because you're living la vida loca. When he said that, I went back and I remember, I'm like, Cisco, man, living, we got to clear that. Cisco had assured us like, oh, I got a relationship with Desmond Child who wrote Living La Vida Loca for Ricky Martin. We good, that's a phone call. Here we go, lawsuit. And then the negotiations started. You know, we went back and forth for how much they thought they should get for the song. And all of a sudden, like, you start seeing your publishing checks going. <laughs> Desmond Child has more ownership of the song than anyone. I'll just put it like that. And I'm sure Cisco didn't purposely say, you know what, no, I'm not gonna clear that, but somewhere along the line, there was definitely an oversight. As a manager, nobody came to me and said, can you get this clear? And then nobody at Def Jam, cause you gotta have your music go through all the licensing department. So I guess nobody noticed it. I really couldn't tell you who's at fault. We just gonna have to take the L on this one. Like we just gotta, we gotta pay them for that. So we paid them, so everybody ate. Everybody that had something to do with it got their piece of the song. <laughs> the legacy of the thong song is introducing the world to thongs, yo. That song was more than just the thong. The fact that my hair was silver and I had on this like leather clothes and the dragon and I'm flying around in my videos. And then you got like artists today who dye their hair every color the rainbow and just expressing themselves in different ways. You can't explain when songs go that big like that. That put us in a different bubble of producers. After Thong Song came out, like in the midst of all the craziness, John McClain calls us and he said, I'm calling you under the instructions of Michael Jackson. He wanted me to call you guys and to tell you, and I quote, if you can give me something hotter than Thong Song, meet me at this address. And it was the address to his recording studio coming full circle to end up that we actually get the call from Michael Jackson because he loved the thong song. And it was like, it was amazing. That's the beauty of when you're on a path, you don't know where you're gonna end up. And that's where all the, the good stuff is. It's in the journey. Just come on, think about it, man. It's bad, dude. That was fun. That was fun recording that song. I don't include everything in my bio, but along with Sinatra and Streisand with whom I work, the thong song is mentioned in my bio. I already had a huge amount of respect for Cisco, but through the recording process of this song, I definitely saw like, okay, he's absolutely forging his own path. The Thong song, it changed everything. It changed people's lives. It changed his life, changed my life. It changed the perception of a young black kid in inner city Baltimore who could go out and become something. It's cool that people still dig the record and they still go nuts over it too, every time we sing it live. Do I ever get tired of singing Thong Song, they ask me. And nah, dude, it's the Thong Song. <laughs> so my wife had the song back in 1976. She made her own thongs. And that was like, I have to marry this woman. <laughs> I like thongs, what can I tell you? <laughs>